everyone, and welcome to our first episode in the series of Meet a Mathematician. I am Dr. Serene Ratilal, a lecturer at the University of Johannesburg, and today I have the extreme pleasure of interviewing a mathematician, none other than Professor Luiso Nonka. Welcome, Prof. How are you doing today? I'm fine, thanks. How are you, Doc? I'm doing very well. I'm so excited that you are actually the first person that we're doing this with. This is a wonderful initiative where we showcase mathematicians and the work that they do. So, Prof, before I, I get into the actual interview, I think it's very important that I boast a little bit about you and so that I will always know <laughs> who you are. <laughs> then I'm going to blush. <laughs> oh, definitely. <laughs> so let me tell the audience about who Professor Luiso is. So Prof Luiso was elected as one of the two vice presidents of the International Mathematical Union. He serves as a liaison between the International Mathematical Union and UNESCO. He is actually a retired professor of mathematics from the University of Witwatersrand, where he was actually the vice chancellor and principal during the term 2003 to 2013. He is currently an emeritus professor at WITS, an honorary professor at the University of Pretoria, and an extraordinary professor at the University of the Western Cape. Prof has actually attended Oxford University through a Rhodes Scholarship and obtained a doctorate in mathematics in 1982. There is so much more that I could share about Prof Luiso Nonta, but Let's actually learn more about him from the person himself. So, so Prof, thank you once again. And the question that I'm going to kick off with is, I think the audience wants to know, where did it all start? What truly got you into mathematics? What influenced you? And why did you become a mathematician? Uh, it's a long story, but I'll try and do it in about 10 seconds. No, 10 minutes. No, no. Okay. Anyway, I, when I was growing up as a, as a young kid in the Eastern Cape, uh, we were not taught mathematics. Mathematics was not available to us. So I was exposed to mathematics for the first time when I was about 16 or 17. And I had to spend an extra year catching up with uh, what I'd missed out on. Uh, uh, my parents wanted me to become a medical doctor. And uh, I went to Forte and realized that I was not good in biological sciences. And I had a, an inspiring lecturer, uh, Professor Tom van Dijk. Uh, and I got a sense that mathematics came. I enjoyed doing that. So anyway, I uh, decided then to register for postgraduate studies in mathematics because I'd been promised a job if I could finish a master's degree in mathematics. So that, that, that's where it started. And then I felt that I needed to go as far as I could in terms of qualifications, which is why I applied for a scholarship to, to go and do a PhD in England. Uh, that, that's very humble beginnings as well, Prof. And I must say, I was really touched by the fact that it was a specific teacher or lecturer that actually helped get you into this. Can you tell us what it was about this teacher that actually sparked something in you? He loved mathematics. He, whenever he was doing a problem on the board and right at the end, he said, Wola! I was a tall African guy and uh, always smiling. And, and I think he enjoyed looking at my solutions. Uh, and I would uh, in most cases, get perfect answers. And, and he engaged me, in fact, in terms of, do you find this difficult? I'll see if you can solve this problem. So it was this constant conversation between myself and him, uh, which really I found energizing. Thanks, Prof. Um, my next question, again, I think this one's an important one, is in order to become a mathematician, can you perhaps tell the students um, what educational background they would require? Are there any recommendations of specific courses that they should take in their journey towards becoming a mathematician? I guess when you get to, of course, people who are at high school, 
there are certain prescribed courses that they have to take. And of course, mathematics is one of them. Please don't take mathematics literacy because you won't be allowed to enroll for a course at university. Obviously, you have to uh, go to university and do a degree, first degree. Um, in South Africa, students have the latitude to choose from a wide uh, menu of courses. And, and one of the things that, looking back now, that maybe I've got a slight regret about is that uh, I, if I could have chosen as many mathematics courses as possible, then my knowledge base would have been broader. But as I pointed out earlier on, because my first objective was to become a medical doctor, so I ended up registering for zoology and botany. So I would encourage them, those when they get to university to register for things like pure mathematics, applied mathematics, statistics, computer science. If you can fit those in your program, then that would be great because it gives you a wide variety of choices that you can make. That's great advice, Prof. And uh, in particular, <clears throat> what about the journey towards, uh, towards postgraduate study? Um, so is it compulsory to obtain a PhD to become a mathematician? I would say it's not compulsory, but <laughs> it's strongly advisable. Um, I mean, uh, in many countries, uh, even on the African continent, uh, if you want to teach at a university, then uh, the entry qualification would be uh, a PhD. But we working at universities should be careful that those people who, want to, who love mathematics and want to teach, that we don't just channel them to think about working at a university. They are TV at colleges and our high school system needs good teachers. So if somebody enjoys teaching, uh, let's say at a high school, then I'll say that a, a PhD or even a master's is not a prerequisite for that. Thanks, Prof. So I posed that question because these were some of the questions that students has, had asked. So thanks for answering that. Um, our next question that was also proposed is, what is the day in the life of a mathematician like? So what are the roles and responsibilities of a mathematician? Again, because I spent all my life at university after I finished my three, uh, maybe I'll start off there that if you are a mathematician working at a university, of course your first job is to teach. And, and therefore you prepare your lectures, you offer your lecture set tests, exams, and so on, which is, which is quite fun. In fact, although I'm retired, I didn't tell you this earlier on, I, I'm teaching this semester, I'm teaching an honors course at WITS, which I find quite enjoyable. I have about 20 students. Wow, that's um, so, exciting. So, I mean, teaching is, 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 is exciting, especially working with young people. And of course, if a one, not if, I think people who work at a university as mathematicians, they also enjoy discovering new mathematics or creating new mathematics, which is what research is about. And, and there's this excitement about research where once you have solved the problem, you know that at that moment, you are the only person in the world who knows the answer to that problem. And of course, they are going to communicate it to your peers and so on. But that feeling of saying, as I'm sitting here now, I'm the only one who knows that this is the answer to this problem. Um, now, of course, uh, people who have an interest in mathematics, mathematical sciences, they can also think about careers outside of the university, outside of teaching in the private sector. And, and the sectors that uh, are on the lookout for people with, let's say, a major in math, a degree in mathematics would be your banks, uh, the financial services sector, banks and insurance companies. And uh, I think they, I mean, having looked at a project called Quantify Your Future, which is it's an eye opener in terms of what people with a first degree in mathematics do in banks like APSA and Standard Bank. That's interesting. I think that's also something we can extend on in a careers in mathematics series. 
that we could perhaps run. But Prof, to touch more on the research aspect of mathematics um, and research mathematicians, I think we're all excited to, to know more about what it is that you had done in your PhD. Can you tell us very simply what you had studied and maybe a result that you had obtained that was new and you had that eureka moment? Um, I studied things called groups. And a simple example of a group is uh, the set of integers that you can add and then you can take two integers like minus two and two and add them and get zero. So that's, that would be a simple example. So there was a class of groups. And, and of course, people here in group theory, in studying groups, want to see what are the building blocks of all the groups that are there in the world. So there was a class of groups where it was not known what a typical building block is. Building block, for instance, if you look at, um, at your counting uh, numbers or integers, you can always factorize them as a product of prime numbers. Six is equal to two times three, and nine is three squared. So it's that kind of breaking down a mathematical entity into simpler structure. So I was able to give a positive answer to say that this is an example of a building block of this class that can be used to build more complex things, which was, yeah, it's something that uh, I always go back and say that you were created by me or <laughs> discovered by myself. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, well, you can definitely go back and say that because you had done it. Prof, um, the other thing I want to, to know, you had explained that as a mathematician, there's, you have a role as a teacher because you'd have to lecture mathematics. You have a role as um, a researcher. Are they, uh, what about actual supervision of students? Can you tell us more about the role of supervising a student to pursue further studies? That's a very good question. I mean, all your questions have actually been very good in terms of uh, throwing some light on what uh, mathematics is about. Uh, supervision of students, one would regard it as a form of teaching, but be that as it may, it's a form of mentorship. Um, where now you as a senior mathematician, you are guiding somebody who wants to follow in your footsteps. Now, um, there are instances, it's, it's for, for the person that is being supervised, it can be a lonely experience because you are now looking at a problem that nobody else is looking at. And therefore, your supervisor is the person who gives you feedback on whether you're on the right track or not. Now there are different types of supervisors, some are helpful, some are indifferent, some are quite awful. And um, I th one of the things that maybe people have been unlucky about in certain instances is ending up with a supervisor who's not helpful. And, and I, the advice that I give young academics like Doc here is that when you supervise younger people, please make sure that you provide them with assistance and advice, and you're always there for them. Thanks, Prof, for that advice. So, so the takeaway here is that when you're a mathematician, that you're, involving in, you're involved in lecturing, you're involved in researching mathematics, creating new ideas, as well as mentorship of the younger generation. So I think that's very exciting. Prof, for you, what do you find you. most exciting in your career? Which aspect excites you the most? I think discovering new mathematics is really exciting and also learning new mathematics. And, and in fact, nowadays, I enjoy reading more about what people are doing in other areas. Uh, whereas people who are building their careers, of course, they are focused on what their research interest is. Uh, discovering new things, even, I mean, even traveling and, 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 and visiting new countries is, is, is exciting. So that, that, that's, uh, that, that's something that I still find invigorating. Definitely, I totally agree with you. Um, I think I wanted to add one more point to that, uh, but it's just escaped me. 
So maybe I will, I will ask you, what further advice would you have to a student who, who wants to pursue the study of mathematics? Is there any nuggets that you would like to share? Um, well, one of them is be intellectually curious. Maybe it's, it's just relates to my, my previous answer. Um, because the various aspects of mathematics which might look unrelated are in fact, there are some connections. Some of them have not been discovered, but there are connections between areas of mathematics that, uh, that may be at first when you are exposed to them, like group theory and you work in topology doc. Mm -hmm. But of course we know that there's a connection between group theory and topology. You can use groups to study topological spaces. So uh, it's, 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 it's looking and exploring and keeping your eyes open about what is happening in, uh, in other areas. The second one is learn to converse in mathematics. Uh, don't think of mathematics as something that is only on a piece of paper and you have to remember. Uh, keep a conversation going with other people who are doing mathematics. Because again, it's through those conversations that maybe you can get some new ideas or new insights from other people. That's wonderful advice, Prof. I, I want to ask you um, one last question before we end, and that is if you could share what is your favorite result in mathematics? Even so, apart from your own results, of course, what is your favorite result in mathematics? <laughs> The one that is, that is, it's not necessarily something that I did myself. Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, there's a result that was, uh, it's, I mean, I like results that are stated in one sentence, a sentence which is very short. Um, there's a result that was established uh, in the early 60s, which basically says every group with an odd number of elements is solvable. Mm -hmm. Now being solvable is connected to whether you have a formula for finding the uh, roots of a polynomial. Now it's stated in less than 10 words, but it took about 300 pages to prove that. Oh. And it was proved by Walter Feit and John Thompson. It, it's, Whenever I, I mean, I, I, I teach honors group theory, I always give them an example of that and say that this is one of the most beautiful theorem I've ever come across. Definitely intriguing. And I guess that's what usually happens in mathematics. A seemingly simple statement ends up having quite often the most longest proof in, of course, not long in the sense that it's inefficient, but long in the sense that it is the most efficient proof to get there in logical steps. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, mm -hmm. mathematics to me is beautiful. It's infinite. Uh, there's just so much to love about it, Prof. And I'm so glad that you Absolutely. are on, on this program to share your love for the subject as well and share that result, which also um, inspires you and, and you love. Um, so thank you, Prof, for joining us today, for being the first person on the Meet a Mathematician series. So to all watching, if you'd like to know more about Professor Luis Ononta, you could simply Google him. As you heard, he is teaching a course this year, this semester at Wits University. So I mean, you could perhaps arrange a visit, drop him an email and chat to him to learn more about the endless possibilities of mathematics. I am Dr. Serene Rathilal lecturer from UJ. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Meet a Mathematician. We'll see you at the next one. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. Thank you for the invitation. I appreciate it.